So uh, my name is Dave Rule. This is Aaron McNally. Um, we both currently work at the Riverbank Zoo. Um, we recently moved there uh, in January. So um, all of this talk is based on when we're at Palm Beach Zoo. Uh, I'll talk as if I still work there because that makes it easier. It gets awkward when I'm talking to Riverbank's people. Um, but uh, one of the things that's unique, uh, we've done this uh, presentation for a few different groups. Um, unique here is uh, Denver Zoo can relate. We're part of a, a club that no one wants to be in where we've lost a keeper. Um, so our goal uh, typically is talking to an institution to plant some seeds for some, some things that we learn through the process so that they never have to deal with it. And for you guys, it's, it's more of so you don't ever have to deal with it again. Um, believe it or not, having something like this happen doesn't mean it's never going to happen again. It actually increases statistically the chances that it will happen again. So, um, you know, safety is always changing and always improving and, and that's really what we're here. We're not here to tell you um, how to do it or what to do. Uh, planting some seeds, uh, we've been going through the various departments, giving you guys ideas, we're here for a resource. Um, as far as my background, I've been in the zoo industry for uh, around 20 years. I started as a construction manager at the Toledo Zoo, uh, was there for 13 years, and then uh, moved down to Palm Beach as a facilities director, and then now I'm the chief operating officer uh, at Riverbanks. Uh, and Erin is a vet tech. Uh, she's been a, a veterinary technician at Toledo and then Palm Beach and now at Riverbanks. And the, the piece that she brings to this at Palm Beach after we had our incident, um, the keepers were not really able to work their area, so the managers and the veterinary staff worked as tiger keepers for the months after the, after the incident. And um, so she was there while we implemented the changes that we'll talk about uh, kind of later in the process. So um, a lot of words on this slide, but the, the point of this uh, everybody that works at a zoo goes through animal escape drills and you practice things that you hope will never happen and most institutions really have this mindset well it's never going to happen here um, but AZA says so so we got to check these drills off our list and we have to prepare for these things that are never going to happen and um, we're here to say it can happen to anybody and um, so that's kind of what what this is all about and you want to add Thing. Yeah, I think another thing that we kind of talked about with some of the keepers today, too, is a lot of times our drills are always the animals escaped, right? Like the animals gotten out of containment. And I think statistically speaking, like we've learned through a lot of the research that the safety committee's done, is more often than not, it's keeper entry into an animal space or public person that got into an animal space, not necessarily that the animal's gotten out. So that's just kind of something to think in the back of your head, too, as maybe in the future you guys are looking at like drills and things like that. It's definitely good to maybe play the scenarios where the more likely scenarios, right? You guys statistically have a higher chance of having an encounter with a dangerous animal or a deadly animal because you're doing and entering in a hazardous space um, way more frequently than the animal potentially could get out. So just kind of food for thought. So the presentation will go over, uh, kind of group into a few areas. So the first thing we'll go through is um, what happened uh, in April of 2016. <coughs> the immediate aftermath and how we reacted to that and how we kind of helped the staff through it, um, what the investigations were all about, the changes we made, and then how we've honored Stacy. So um, we'll get into it. Okay. 
What gate shall I send FEMS to? At this time, send to the front gate. Okay, and what happened? I'll have to get the paramedics coming, Joe. So, okay. Okay, it's going to be on the west side of the zoo. West side. Oh, that's for the man. We have an animal. Okay, we have an animal situation going on, so we're going to do this. Hey. I understand. There's a human that's injured. We need you to come on the west side of the zoo. We'll have people to direct you. So that um, that 911 call is obviously very hard to listen to. Um, I had actually never listened to it until we were getting ready for this presentation. Um, I've done this presentation without this slide, but uh, I was involved in meetings with 911 after this to discuss this call, but I was never able to really listen to the whole thing because it's it's pretty hard to listen to. But um, the reason I play it is if you're involved in an incident and you have information that you can share with that person whose responsibility is to call 911, you have to get them that information quickly because it slows things down. 911 is trained to ask questions and gather information so that the people that show up on site know they're not showing up for a sprained ankle. And um, Palm Beach Zoo, we had a policy not to mention the type of animal because the reality is the minute you mention that, they broadcast that over the uh, police and rescue radios that the media monitors. And the minute the word tiger went out, the media responded and they were there before the ambulances. Um, but that being said, if you hold back, it just slows down. And so uh, it's painful to listen to the back and forth and how complicated that process is of getting uh, 911 to respond. but. Um, it's important, important to hear. So this is the original first slide to the presentation. Um, so April 15th, 2016, started out just another day. Um, it was my birthday. And um, around lunchtime, um, Aaron had come into work to take me to lunch. And um, when we were heading off grounds, um, my last, uh, that was my last interaction uh, with Stacy because she talked with Nina, who was um, the zoo voice on that 911 call, and um, I was trying to stay under the radar and I don't like a big deal about my birthday. So Stacy had uh, Nina say happy birthday over the radio, and I could hear her laughing in the background, and that was that was the last um, interaction I had. So we went to lunch, uh, came back, I literally picked up my radio off the desk, and I hear the radio call. Um, and again, we've all been involved in drills, and the good ones, we try to make it sound real, but you always kind of know it's a drill. Um, and in just a split second, I knew that it wasn't a drill. Um, it was our horticulture manager, and he simply said, um, I need help, there's something wrong in the Tiger Night House. <clears throat> and we all responded, and um, I grabbed my radio and I sprinted clear across the zoo to get there. 
Um, prior to that in my career, uh, safety and emergency preparedness was just been one of those things I was involved in because I had to be. So I got there and I really wasn't trained to do much of anything, so I got assigned to uh, monitoring the back gate where the first responders would come in and out of. Uh, I literally had to have a contractor block the gate with his truck to keep the media out. Uh, and so that was my responsibility, watching people come and go. And then, um, so the last, the last image I have is like a scene from Grey's Anatomy where the stretcher comes out and um, paramedics on top doing CPR. And that's uh, an image that I'll always have. Um, and Erin had uh, an even harder role, so I'll let her talk a little bit about that. So the day that this happened was actually my day off. It was a Friday. Um, but as Dave said, I was by the zoo because I took him to lunch. And um, we lived about 20 minutes or so away, but I was only maybe five minutes down the road when Dave texted me that something happened at Tiger, it's bad. And I was reading it and like just not believing it, which I know I'm not supposed to check my phone when I'm driving, but I was. Because um, <laughs> those words, I mean, were very powerful. So I called him right away and he, I said, well, what do you mean? And he's, you know, I don't even really remember the words, obviously. Um, but, you know, something happened at Tiger, I don't know, it's bad, um, the keeper's down sort of thing. And I'm like, well, this is a drill. It's got to be a drill. Um, and he says, no, this is not a drill. Um, and I think I asked two or three times, are you sure it's not a drill? And he said, no. So I you turned back to the zoo. Um, as a veterinary technician, as most of you guys know, our role is to help immobilize the animal or recapture the animal, um, whatever means necessary, um, as far as dart and things like that go. Um, so I knew, like, my vet, uh, we had a relief vet as well, so we had a full-time vet, relief vet, and the other tech were there. I know that they grabbed their emergency stuff that they needed, but like, what did they forget? So I went straight to the Tiger Building. As Dave said, he was there manning the gate. Um, media was already there, so there's, I mean, I saw reports later, some of the footage, a video of me running in plain clothes to the Tiger, um, tiger area because the media, again, was there before the paramedics were. Like, I was there just before paramedic st um, staff was. So again, media's already there. Um, so I ran up, asked what did they forget, what do you need? So, you know, just the basic other emergency things other than your drugs, your darts, and your dart gun. Um, so I went and grabbed like the full syringe and just, you know, random anesthesia things that we might need for the tiger itself. Uh, made my way back to the building. Um, the animal had already been darted the first time I had gotten there, so that was a pretty quick response by our vet team. And um, by the time I got back the second time, they were waiting for the animal to go down a little bit more to be able to actually gain entry into the building. Um, so where the incident happened was in one of the bedrooms, but you still have that risk, right, where the keeper door was open um, from animal space to keeper space. So at some point when the animal was darted, it, went, it did go into another bedroom away from Stacy, which was great, um, but somebody had to go in and, and close that shift door. So we had another keeper do that um, right around the time that I was there. Um, so the, Main thing I kind of saw, just the back of our night houses are open mesh pretty much um, for most of the walls because we're in Florida. And you can see the tiger in one of the bedrooms, obviously sleepy looking. Um, my vet was in the back hallway with the general curator. I was standing with the keeper behind the building. I remember seeing random staff, keeper staff kind of in the tiger complex area. Um, but the key moment for me was, again, like Dave said, our tiger buildings are connected by a chute system, so you have to go over these stairs to get up and over the chute. So the stretcher came up and over with the paramedic on top of Stacy doing um, CPR. And when that stretcher cleared my line of vision, the one person I saw in my view was Jeremy Hanwester, which is Stacy's husband. So that image is in my head all the time um, when we talk about this kind of thing. But I knew that moment, okay, it's my day off. Jeremy needs to get to the hospital. We need to get to the hospital right away they're taking her to the hospital. So we jumped, I said, get in my car, we're going to the hospital now. So we jumped in my car and very proudly, not proudly, I say we beat life light to the hospital some way, somehow. I spent quite a bit, probably. Um, and we were just kind of like in shock, obviously, on the drive there, um, just trying to convince Jeremy to call her parents, because I knew, one, the video was already there, and these things get out really fast, and even though they live in California, I mean, they're gonna see it, and they need to hear it from you but then that means that he's admitting that something happened, you know? So just trying to convince someone to call their wife's family to tell them if we don't know much information, but it's bad sort of thing. Um, that was kind of my role. And then at the hospital, 
you know, I started at the zoo in 2015, about a year prior in March 2015. So I've, again, like Dave said, um, I mean, we were close friends with Stacey and Jeremy, but not someone that like I've known for years. So here I am, this person he's only hung out with maybe three, four times outside of work, sitting in the hospital next to him while we, you know, find out that his, his wife is now dead. Um, so that was my role um, for the initial response. I wasn't necessarily the vet tech on duty, but I was the right-hand person for um, for Jeremy uh, that day, and just being there when the chaplain, you know, came out and confirmed, and then going back and saying goodbye to her um, was what I dealt with that day. Um, and I will say that also when we got to the hospital, the media was already at the hospital. Um, they were across the street. So once everything was kind of said and done, um, and we had said goodbye to Stacey, we actually had two other keepers that did arrive to the hospital, which was great, because they were actually able to kind of sneak us out of the hospital. So it's crazy that like that's even something that like happened, but it's the reality is the media were right there and it wasn't really safe for us to go to my vehicle so we actually took another keeper's vehicle left and we left my car at the hospital all day and night. So um, uh, while all that's going on I'm, I'm manning still manning the gate I'm sitting there with my uh, maintenance manager um, trying to you know, still letting people in and out at this point uh, it's police doing an investigation, things like that, uh, a lot of kind of meandering. Um, and uh, Aaron calls me and lets me know that <clears throat> uh, Stacy didn't make it. And with what I had seen, kind of Jason and I had talked about that, you know, it was a possibility, but it kind of in denial. And then at that point, it's no longer in denial. And I, you know, I told Jason, and he's like, well, this, this can't really be real. Um, he's been at the zoo shorter time than, than I had and had only been in the zoo field for a year, so he came from a different industry, so the fact that this kind of thing can happen was, was crazy to him. And um, so we'll go over a little bit about, um, about Stacy. Um, as, as Aaron referenced, I mean, she was one of our, our friends, I mean, at a small zoo especially, but any zoo, you know, you're kind of family. At a small zoo, you literally you know everyone. Um, and when we started down there, we were new to South Florida, and Stacy was one of those first people that reached out to us, uh, invited us over for game night to play Cards Against Humanity, because that's how you get to know people. Um, and, and so and we had her over for Thanksgiving just a few weeks before this happened. Easter, a few weeks before this happened. Um, and, and she wasn't, you know, a lot of people from outside the industry always think, well, the person wasn't trained. They, they, they were a rookie. Um, Stacy was uh, highly trained. Uh, she had her, her degree. Um, she had been working dangerous cats for over 10 years. She was one of our senior keepers. And if you'd asked me, um, what's the keeper? Who's the keeper at the zoo that you trust the most? I would have said Stacy. So, you know, that's the kind of person that it happens to. It, it's not. It wasn't a rookie mistake. Um, she was part of the feeler tag and truly an advocate for for her animals. So, it's the next day, um, but kind of a little bit before that. So. Within a couple hours, OSHA's there doing investigations. The police never left. Um, and we didn't, as the leadership of the zoo and some of the senior animal managers, we didn't get out of there until after midnight when we finally uh, sent the OSHA guy to his hotel and said, we'll start this back up in the morning. Um, and then, of course, the, the bat stuff had something that they had to deal with that Aaron can. So one thing that's not really like a well-known topic, I should say, um, but many places, I know having done Brazil, having gone through something similar, I can imagine that there are people out there that had to do similar things, but there is no cleanup service that comes in and does the cleanup. So um, the staff usually that are the most trained for biomedical waste hazards are your veterinary staff. So that is something that the other two vet members um, of my team had to deal with that day while I was still with Jeremy. Um, pretty late in the night, um, and when I got back to the zoo at like 11 o'clock, they were still in the tiger night house. So you can't clean or touch anything in the night house or wherever it happens until 
they're done looking at it, taking pictures, you know, doing whatever they need to as far as investigations go. So I mean, you can't clean anything until until that that time. So um, it's just kind of a random thing, but it's just something else that obviously it's way more than one person, um, and there's just other duties that potentially um, and things people witness or have to do that um, are going to impact them for quite a while after. So the. We closed the zoo immediately when it happened. We got all the guests out and we stayed closed for a few days. So the next morning, um, we had an all staff meeting and obviously we still have animals to take care of. Um, but if you guys have all been through the Just Culture talk, you know it's those the stresses and things that can make uh, accidents um, really come through well, everybody was completely under stress. So even if you're just taking care of a, a guinea pig, um, we came up with a system where we paired people up and um, Aaron got it from uh, Finding Nemo. Everybody had to have a swim buddy. So it doesn't matter what animal you were taking care of, you had to have somebody with you. If it was the, the ambassador animals and things like that, it might be an educator with you or a grounds person. Um, and the dangerous animals, obviously, it had to be two trained keepers. But everybody worked together, and we kept that system up for several weeks, even after the zoo reopened. Um, we reduced the workload. We stopped all shows, all keeper talks, all behind-the-scenes experiences, all that kind of thing we put on hold. Um, and we went from a policy where you're going to your exhibit, you're supposed to take visitor paths whenever necessary, make eye contact with guests, to if you can get to your building from a service road, stay behind the scenes, stay, just stay out of sight, take care of your animals, take your time, be safe. Um, deciding when to reopen, there was never a good time. I think we were closed for two and a half days. Um, and then when we reopened again, it was very limited uh, visibility. Um, and the, from the staff, it was, um, you know, the most difficult thing is People are curious, your guests are curious, and they might have a simple question like, hey, did you know Stacy?" That, for especially the first few weeks, just brings you to tears, and they didn't mean anything by it. And then we had some issues with the media and things like that where we were also suspicious that it was an undercover reporter trying to dig up dirt. So we have these two things in our mind that we're juggling as we try to answer these questions. And when we started Keeper Ta Talks back up, that was all of the keepers' biggest fears is, what if they ask me about Stacy? what am I gonna do? So we add an extra person to every keeper talk that was um, a more senior level person. So if things fell apart, you could literally just step away and that senior person could take over. So things like that. Um, I put... One other thing note too is, I, mean, I think pretty much everybody on staff, at least know that myself, the other vet members, our vet team members, and keepers, um, everybody knows that this is all received private Facebook messages from reporters. Um, they all want to know things, you know, they all want to dig up things. So again, you're just kind of like on heightened security. Um, I feel like the zoo itself gave quite a bit of information and we were pretty upfront, but you know, it always seems like you're hiding things. Because one, there's only so much we can say at the time and there's only so much we know. But um, the other thing we got, you know, like Dave said, we have animals to take care of. Well, the tiger kept getting death threats as well. Um, so that's one thing. I know initial reports came out that we euthanized the animal, not the case. Um, we got, you know, scrutinized for not taking lethal force because we chose to do a dart. Uh, we, given the situation, felt that that was the best and it, it was, and I still stand by that. Um, that animal, you know, leaves when uh, darted and that's what happened. The animal, as soon as it was darted, backed away and went to a different bedroom. Um, so it's definitely the right call, but we got scrutinized for that. And again, then the animal had death threats, so we had police there at the zoo for 24-7 actually for a few days because um, we had some suspicious people, some suspicious activity, um, just people sitting out in front of the tiger exhibit that just kind of looked, it just gave you those weird vibes, you know? Um, so we had that all on top of right. dealing with Have to manage hiring off-duty yeah. police to guard your tiger. Yeah. Um, it was hard to wrap our heads around. Um, so I, I have this bullet, the new normal, that it's one of those phrases that I hate, but it, it's, it's real. It's, it's actually never normal again. Um, even though we don't work there anymore, we look at everything different, uh, anybody at that zoo. And I, I'm sure that anyone um, that's here, that was here um, when, when you lost Ashley, it, it's, it's, the reality is it's, just, it's never the same. Um, and then, you know, 
the leadership of the zoo is all wrapped up in investigations and uh, communication with the media and things like that. And after this all staff meeting, you know, everybody's just sitting around crying and the CEO and some of the other people, they, they go off to deal with OSHA and things like that. And I looked around and just realized that, you know, we needed help. And I had heard some things from the night before. Um, the police department brought in a grief counselor who was trained to deal with basically police officers who've been involved in a shooting. And people walked out of that room and said, well, I'm never doing that again. And so I knew that was not the answer. Um, so um, I got, I just started searching the internet for grief counseling and things like that. And I, I found that most states and most counties have what's called a critical incident stress management division or group. And oddly, uh, West Palm Beach or Palm Beach County didn't call me back and the county next to us didn't call me back. But I got um, Cindy Krosky's number. I don't even remember how I got it. I dialed that number and she answered the phone and she was from two counties away. And she said, give me two hours and I'll be there. And she came down and she helped us come up with a, a grief counseling plan. Uh, she is uh, forever one of my heroes for really diving in and helping. Um, she talked to me about the difference between one-on-one -on -one counseling and group counseling. And in a, a place like a zoo where it's like a family, she really recommended group counseling and really encouraging everyone to be part of it. And we, we literally, the first couple of sessions, we sat, sat in a room like this and just went around the table and she would ask little simple questions about things that would, to get people talking. And um, it, it, a lot of animal people are not big sharers with humans. They like their animals. So to get that group talking, she really, she really had a talent for that. And we, we really, we just talked and cried. And you know, there's a lot of words in this graphic, but the one that's not in there, or if it is, it's really small print, is anger. Because even though the investigations took six months before we figured out that you know, Stacy had broken protocol and that's what cost her her life, we knew that the shift door wasn't broken and the cage wasn't broke. We knew that these things hadn't happened. And so the question was, you know, Stacy, how could you do that? And to sit in a room and talk about that and have somebody tell you it's okay to be angry, uh, that was a really, a really key piece. The other, um, I'll say lucky find that I had one of our zoo volunteers also volunteered for this National Crisis Response Canines Group. So she hooked me up. Um, with Connie and uh, her dog Lacey, uh, Lady, which I believe was this one right here. Um, so this is a, na a nationwide group that have volunteers that are trained counselors with um, trained crisis dogs that are trained. And anybody that's a dog owner knows that when you're sad, your dog un realizes it and it'll be kind of extra snuggly or whatever. Well, these dogs are trained to really figure out the people that are hurting the most and kind of you know, nuzzle them and get them to talk and get them to cry. And um, it was the first time, it, it, it took about a day and a half to get them there. And, you know, some of the keepers laughed and smiled and, you know, they loved the dogs. We brought them back for several of the group counseling sessions just to kind of break the ice and get people talking and, and get animal people to kind of let their guard down. So, and then there's um, some other things that that I learned really from uh, Cindy, and she really um, talked to me a lot about how to help the staff and you know, the making time to grieve. So we would have, um, we had lunch together every day and it wasn't you know, your typical busy day as a keeper where you get lunch when you can. It was when it was lunchtime, everybody stop what you're doing, come to the cafe and we're gonna have lunch. The zoo provided it. Um, when people are grieving, when this level of stress is there, you're not thinking about, oh, I need to pack a lunch today. It's gonna to be 90 and humid, I need a water bottle. So we had the grounds people going around with water and Gatorade, making sure people were hydrated. Uh, we were providing food. We got together every morning to talk about safety and things like that, and just had times to be together and just kept people talking about it. We didn't want anybody kind of shutting down and keeping it inside, even though a few people uh, still were doing that. It, we worked really hard to just 
kind of stay a family. And honestly, we, we really bonded in a way we, we never had. So another thing too, like it goes well beyond just the first couple days, weeks, months. You know, and some people grieve, as we all know, at different times. So I know like the other tech, um, you know, I told me early on that she, like she's good, you know what, it's not gonna probably hit me until a few months later. And it's true, I mean, a few months later, maybe eight months out, I could see it kind of coming back into play. So just recognizing that it may not be initial for everybody and just knowing that, hey, you may need to check up on them, you know, later. Um, was really key, especially for the people that are taking care of the dangerous animals still beyond that point, and knowing when to say, hey, are you good, or you know, what do we need to do, and just kind of really checking on them um, beyond that first couple weeks. So the communication challenges, and I put this, this slide in here, I talk about this a little bit, because you know, as a staff, you're going to be thinking that you need, you need, to, you need information. Um, you know, leadership's not telling us things. And I, I was fortunate to be kind of in both groups. So I was in a lot of the investigation meetings and a lot of those and a lot of the meetings with our PR consultant on what do we say and how do we say it and when do we say it. Because with the media, you got to keep feeding them information. Um, but the leadership of the zoo's job is to protect the zoo. And even though we truly believed that the zoo had done nothing wrong, the media and the investigators were acting like we had. And so they had to really carefully craft the messages to try to, to get the story out and get the details that we knew out in a, a correct way and the balance of do you tell the media first, do you tell the staff first. Um, and then we had issues with, as Aaron had referenced, the media had reached out to some staff and some staff had taken the bait. So we had instances where we'd tell the staff something first and before we could tell the media, it's on TV as if we're hiding it. So then you know, there's all this kind of give and take going on. So as a staff, you've got to keep asking your manager. And as a manager, you've got to keep asking the leadership. But you also have to understand when they say, well, we don't have anything new yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we can. But you've got to keep asking because the leadership's also very consumed, and they might forget to communicate because that's actually human nature to forget to communicate. So Other things to protect, too. I mean, we need to protect like Stacy in her name, right? Like, even though a mistake was made, I mean, it's any of us that can make that same mistake and then cost our lives. So it's not, you know, like she intentionally did something wrong, a mistake was made, you know, but in protocol was broke and it cost her her life and that could be any of us, you know. Um, but it's not like to say it was intentional um, or things like that. So trying to provide the right information without the media twisting it, you know, um, to make it sound like it was this, you know, Stacy did this and it was so intentional and whatever. It's not, um, but trying to figure out how you say things and you know, what you say is, is definitely crucial. And Jeremy to protect and her family and you know these things. I mean, the media was at his house before we got back to the hospital, from the hospital. So there's so much that goes into the communication thing. Um, and you know, so much. But so many of us are all social media a lot too, and it's like our vent and like our therapy too. Um, so just trying to really figure out what what you can say, what you can't say. You know, you have so many people reaching out to you um, while all this is going on. So it's just, it was just an interesting way to, to live and look at things. Yeah, you know? and none of us wanted to hear that it was Stacy's fault. As much as it would have been bad for the zoo, we wanted it to be a door failed or the tiger ripped through the mesh or something like that. Because, you know, how can your friend who was one of the, you know, the most trained keepers you know, how could she have made that mistake? Uh, so we, we didn't really want to hear it, even though we, we knew that that was ultimately going to be the answer. So investigations. Um, within 12 hours, we had seven investigations going on, and that's, that in itself is a lot to manage. Um, the AZA was actually uh, very supportive. Uh, they reached out to us, gave us some advice, and kind of took a step back they weren't drilling right into it because they knew, because as an organization, they've been through this, they knew all this other stuff was going on. The two that were the, the front runners were, were these two here. So the local police department and OSHA. And um, you know, we all learn in school that you're innocent until proven guilty, but from an investigation standpoint, they assume that the zoo is guilty OSHA assumes the zoo is guilty. The police department assumes that somebody did this on purpose. 
So their first question was, who had a key to that area? And like many zoos, uh, a lot of people. So the way Palm Beach was set up at that time, if you were trained on uh, any carnivore, you had a key for the carnivore building. If you were trained on bears and only bears, your key would get you into Tiger. So every single keeper, uh, including your husband Jeremy, who was a trained carnivore keeper, was now a murder suspect. And that is how they were treated, and that is how they were interviewed. Key. And anyone that held a master key, and uh, whether you were there that day or not, if you were there that day, you weren't actually allowed to leave until you were interviewed. And so it's a really horrible thing. And then to have them really single out Jeremy as a murder suspect, and you know anybody that knew them, they were like, one of those perfect couples, and you know, they've been married for 10 years, but they acted like they had just met, and they were, they were great together. So to hear them say that was really difficult, and to know that they were interviewing Jeremy and asking him these horrible questions. And then you have OSHA really accusing the zoo and uh, interviewing staff, and um, I, I respect the outcome of what we learned from OSHA, but our actual OSHA investigator was, was really a horrible human being. Um, he treated the people and the zoo pretty terrible to come up with a result of no citations issued uh, and just a handful of recommendations. So in the end, we had done everything right, but the way he treated us was, was pretty rotten. But uh, as the facility director, I, I really had to separate myself from the way he was treating us and listen to the things he was saying and use those um, to make our zoo better. So just real brief, um, and I, I've kind of already covered it, but like Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, they focus on animal welfare. USDA focuses on animal welfare. Their investigations were fairly painless because the reality is we hadn't done anything to uh, put the animal's welfare in jeopardy, had the right choice to been euthanized, these two investigations would have been a lot more harsh, but since we had darted, um, they really were pretty easy on us. Um, these two obviously were tough. Um, AZA was, uh, again, they were very supportive, but they're looking out for the industry as a whole, so they need to look out for if Palm Beach Zoo had done, done anything that makes the whole zoo industry look bad. So oh. if you'll notice too, the oh, yeah, sorry. West Palm Beach one is still open. So they look at it as they have to find somebody guilty. So like they can't put a tiger as the guilty party, right? Um, or we can get it probably ruled as an accident, but then that's more paperwork and you really kind of have to push for that. And anytime you make any sort of move involving anything with the case or the paperwork, the media, it's all right. back in the media and the judges everything back up for everybody again. So. If the zoo really wants to, they can probably pursue it to get it to close um, and rule this an accident because that's really what it was. Um, but until they do that, it would remain Right. Open. They have to file a public document to get it closed. So at this point, they've just left it So it's not saying open. that the zoo's still you know, in question. It's, it's just they need paperwork to file to close it. So if there's any office fans out there, um, some, some great advice from, from Dwight. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, that's not true. And that especially applies to safety. You can always find a new, safer way. You have to always be looking for it. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about making changes, and uh, early on in the OSHA investigations, they hadn't put anything in writing, but the investigator would make comments, and I'm taking notes. Uh, and our CEO at the time, Andrew, was, was hearing the same things I was hearing. And as an institution, we, we decided. Um, we're not gonna wait, even though we were getting the feeling that there weren't gonna be any citations issued. Um, anybody that actually uh, has, knows any uh, OSHA laws, uh, they have a general duty clause and they could pretty much find any business out there guilty of something if they really wanted to. So we were worried that we would get some citation on some technicality. Um, but what we looked at is they were making some of these recommendations, again, not in writing, but hey, you should do this. And, you know, In a, an automotive plant, we would have done that. And some of them, we would look at them and say, well, 
this is this is a zoo. We don't do things that way. But then we kind of took a step back and, and decided, and Andrew said, well, if we can make this safer, we're going to do it now. Um, on you know, The legal team had a little hesitation because if you make changes, that almost implies that you've done something wrong. And we were in the full process of documenting that we had done everything right according to our current protocols. But in the meantime, we found a way to make things safer. Um, down to the fact that actually the lawyers wrote the title for this presentation so that it doesn't, we're not making the zoo safe, we're making a safe zoo safer. And that's, that's what we like to help other zoos do. So there's a lot of questions um, by staff. Why do we change? What do we change? When do we change? And how do we change? And so the next few slides are gonna go kind of over those changes, starting with the whys and then um, the what. So one of the whys, and I didn't know this at the time, uh, the meeting that I went to with Holly, uh, with the safety committee, they had done uh, a lot of research. So they took a 10 year period from 2006 to 2016 and researched uh, deaths in the zoo industry in our country. Um, and there had been uh, eight human deaths and 17 animal deaths uh, in the zoo industry. Two of those deaths were um, at AZA institutions, and uh, of course, we all know who those two people were. Um, the others, uh, and those involved cats. Uh, there was one other death uh, in San Francisco where the tiger had escaped and um, killed a guest. And then the rest were bear incidents in non AZ institutions. So these are, um, those were any big cats, bears, or great ape statistics? Yes. There have sorry. been no deaths by great apes um, documented, at least. Right. Known. Um, but that's what these statistics come from for a 10 year span. Yes. And so, from the safety committee's re uh, research and the direction they went, we pulled great apes out of it because great apes escape and sometimes people get in with them and they sometimes cause injuries, but there's no, no uh, recorded incident of a human dying. Uh, from a great ape escape or a human intrusion into their space. Uh, what we did find that there's this common thread. Um, and in the cases of seven out of the eight cases where uh, a keeper was killed, it was when that keeper, working alone, inadvertently ended up in the space that the animal was either in or had access to. So that's that common thread. when. When you walk through that door that divides keeper space from animal space, and you're working by yourself, and the animal has access, that's what happened to Stacy. Um, she went into a stall, a shift door was open, and the animal was on the other side. Um, it applies to both the AZA and non-AZA, and it applies to experienced, well-trained keepers. And so our commitment and the AZA uh, safety committee commitment is we need to work together to develop standards and so that's why we're here that's why we, we share this with uh, with other zoos so there's there's three stories that uh, Aaron and I have become very familiar with through this process um, one is is uh, your keeper Ashley uh, at the workshop that Holly and I were at at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo um, there was a pretty detailed description of that event um, Obviously, we're familiar with Stacy, and then a little less than a year after Stacy was killed, I saw on the news where uh, Rosa King was killed at a zoo in England. And I did a quick Google search and found the director's name, our email address, and sent him an email and said, "Hey, um, I've been through this. If you need to talk, if you need any advice, if you need to know how to deal with media, any of that, um, just reach out to me. I'm, I'm there to help." Uh, and he emailed me back, very grateful. Um, and about a year ago, uh, Aaron was presenting at the British... Veterinary Zoo Society. So she was presenting at the British Veterinary Zoo Society. So we were over in England, uh, and we drove up, and we met with them, and got a first-hand story of um, what had happened to Rosa. And the circumstances were all really similar. It's that that opening of that door and that sharing that space with that animal, that's, 
that's where it happens. That's what happened to Rosa. That's what happened to Stacy, and that's what happened to Ashley. So the key in Rosa's um, situation too is she was actually she's a senior keeper in the area as well. Um, there was a tiger involved with her incident, uh, Malayan tiger, ironically enough. Um, she actually was the keeper the day before and closed the exhibit in the night houses the night before. So she should, one, have known what she did yesterday, um, but two, also, she's the senior keeper of the area, so she should know the protocol and what to do and what to check for um, before she actually goes out onto exhibit and services the exhibit. So um, she had left the configuration how it was the night before, and so she was the one that serviced the next morning. Um, so in her morning routine, uh, what they kind of gathered because again no one was there to actually see what happened um, was that she was able to go out on exhibit their exhibit was kind of it's a very kind of long um, exhibit and part of it's kind of divided by an indoor viewing area for guests so if you can picture it there's most of the exhibit goes around this building so you can't really see what's around that building it's blind so if you do a check thoroughly beforehand you can obviously see the whole exhibit and make sure your cat's off of it plus making sure they're locked inside and all these other protocol things right um, so she made entry into the exhibit as if she normally would she cleaned the windows to that indoor um, viewing area from the exhibit side and then when she went back to leave the exhibit because she was done she was attacked from behind so she was able to do her entire routine on the exhibit without knowing that the cat was actually on the other side of that building so she was in there for who knows you know who knows how long but a very good period of time before she actually and she never knew you know um, I firmly believe she probably never knew the entire time um, just the way that things were the tail was set nice gently down on the ground and she was exiting the exhibit as if she never knew so that's definitely something um, that again the common thread the keeper entering the space of which an animal had access to and one thing too I found very eerie when we were touring the area is that, you know the keeper access gate is right by the ship door so like whether you forgot to do your checks in the building or lock that animal in you should see that door either of the doors that give you access um, for our cat right when you have make entry so that was that was kind of missed too so but it's just kind of that blind you know doing your routine as if you normally do so in her case um, they believe about 45 minutes or so went by before she was found um, and the animal was prey guarding um, they were able to recall the animal and the animal came back in so that animal is, is fine and well today um, so that animal did not have to be guarded or had a lethal shot taken um, but she did lose her life so and it was um, was found by a guest and the other piece of that is um, when you you tie it into some of the things that Holly and Becca have been talking to with just culture and the the, the mistakes and the the fallible human mind, their protocol was that all tigers are locked in at night. But if any of you guys are cat keepers, you know that sometimes cats don't really care about your protocol. So their policy was you try for a period of time and then if the cat won't shift in, you leave them access, you announce it over the radio, and then you go home. And the next morning, um, you're supposed to check on where's the cat, lock them inside, uh, and you can only guess that she has this routine where every morning she comes in, she services the exhibit, and the cat's always locked in. And she forgot, you know, whatever. She had a crazy night. Um, a lot on her mind. Muscle memory. Here's my routine. I go in, I open the door. Never mind that she walked right past the open shift door that's supposed to be closed. And that's why um, when we talk in a little bit about engineering controls to to stop you from making that mistake when you forgot what you what you did last night. You forgot which doors you left open. Uh, it's so important. So um, a little bit more about why. Um, Jeff Halter gave a talk at the uh, mid-year conference for AZA last year based on seeing my talk a year before that. and. Um, he has some really good uh, thoughts on that, so I have a little video clip of his presentation. Um, at the end of my talk, you'll see that um, you, can, you can search and find his whole talk as well as two others on the subject, but um, I'll let kind of Jeff go through his, his piece of it. Um, so after the incident at Palm Beach, 
there was a lot of media that was coming out. Um, and so we sat with our keepers and our management staff and just said, look, these people are doing everything right. Like when, when the, their director reported out on it, they were doing everything that everybody was doing and it still happened. Um, and I uh, worked cats as a one keeper. Um, I worked cats as a two keeper. And if you would ask me at that time, I would say that I felt safer with a one keeper rule. And this was my reason. My reason was if I make a mistake, I'm the one that gets killed. But our industry can't take that. And what happened to Palm Beach Zoo um, was bigger than just one person's incident. It was to an entire, um, it was into the entire zoo, and it was to the entire community, and it was into the entire AZA community. And we can't have that be our answer. And so I'm embarrassed to have said that that is my answer, that as a keeper I was like, well, it's only me that gets hurt. But that's not the truth of these situations. They're way bigger than one person or one animal. So when we had the conversation, we said, well, let's risk assess what our biggest issue is, and that was putting cats into the exhibit. And the risk assessment for that looks like we put a cat in the exhibit and if one of our exterior doors is open then a cat is uh, going to escape, the cat's going to escape onto the uh, zoo, we're going to pull firearms, then um, we may or may not end up discharging a firearm. Well that seems really unsafe. So our very first step was to um, have managers go down and check the exhibit security before we let cats out in the yard. And the keepers were really opposed to that. They were like, why are you checking up on us? We don't want to do this radio call. Everybody knows when we're putting our animals out. Um, and so I said, well, let's just test it for a month. And if we don't like it, it doesn't fit for our institution, then let's revisit it. And after that month, they were like, we're really glad that you're coming down. And we feel like we have support from the management. And we feel like you guys know what's going on in our operation. So the unintended consequence of implementing this policy that they didn't want us in to implement was they felt better, they felt safe. Um, so after that, then we um, looked at other things that we could implement. Um, and I was lucky, um, I uh, visit Florida um, a couple of times a year to do sea turtle conservation. And after Dave presented last year, I said, for the first time, I think somebody has figured it out for us. I thought that it was, I, you know, I've heard one keeper rule, two keeper rule, which one's safer, and you know, we could go back and forth all day long. And for the very first time, I heard somebody present on something that I felt like that one thing would have saved that person's life. And if you're in, if you're in any of your roles, um, but especially if you're in my role or a director role. The last thing we want to do is have that conversation with somebody's family. And so every day that every day that I work, I say, what do I not want to be on a witness stand for? And what do I not want to tell somebody's family? Those are two litmus tests that I use to, to say, is this worth doing? And this is definitely worth doing. So um, we'll talk about that that one thing, the engineering control, and a lot of supporting administrative controls. So a little bit of a very brief kind of uh, OSHA 101 here. Um, so in the world of OSHA, there's a hierarchy of controls. So the, the best thing you can do if you has, have a hazard, and for us our hazards are these um, potentially deadly animals. So their first thing would be eliminate the hazard. Well, we're not going to eliminate them from our collections because it, it's really, uh, it, it's what we do. We're not going to substitute it with a stuffed animal. So one and two for OSHA, they really don't apply to us. So the, the next best thing we can do is engineering controls. And this is, you know, in OSHA terms, very uh, simply isolate the people from the hazard. So that is what an engineer control does. It's a physical stop that separates that, that thing that's releasing that hazard from happening. Um, and then there's administrative controls that's changed the way that people work, that's protocols. Um, there's other things you'll, you'll see that we've done uh, at Palm Beach to kind of make things safer. And, and if you go back to um, 
Holly and Becca's presentation, it's layers of cheese. So these are layers of cheese, and, and the engineering control is a layer of cheese that you, you can't remove. It's always there. Um, and then PPE is kind of the last level. It's what most places with most hazards go to first. There's not a lot of PPE against the tiger. Uh, a lot of places ha uh, use the bear spray or the pepper spray. Uh, and a lot of places use what they call slam door. So on your way out, you can slam a door behind you and that protects you from that animal. But for that to work, you have to outrun a tiger. So uh, those are not really um, your best. So, so for number three, for the engineering controls, we have to look at ways to keep staff from inadvertently sharing the same space with these animals. Um, that's a quote from the uh, safety committee's uh, white paper that was submitted uh, to AZA. And, and this is this, the seed that I want to plant. So what I'm going to show you is the method that Palm Beach used to implement this. And there's another clip from Jeff Halter on how Henry Vila Zoo implemented it. Um, it's not a cookie cutter. It's not like you can take, okay, Palm Beach Zoo did it. We're done doing it here. You have to take that, um, the foundation of that, and figure out how to make it work in your areas. <coughs> So traditional uh, locking systems in zoos, a lot of zoos, you have, um, you have an animal. This is, the, this is the door we're talking about. This is the animal that separates keeper space from animal space. You have a key. If you're trained, you have the key. You can open that door. You can open all the other doors. You can get in the building. You can do shift doors, feed chutes, gates into keeper spaces. So kind of one key does it all. Um, most often at zoos, doesn't matter if it's a tiger, bear, uh, whatever. If you're trained on one of those animals, you have that key. Palm Beach was very similar. Um, Florida Fish and Wildlife had this regulation where you have to have actually two locks on it. So we were really set up for a two key system already. Um, but the, the two key system, so this is, this is that one thing that Jeff talked about. Um, it's an engineering controlled me mechanically prevent watch out number one and number two. And those are also from the white paper. So watch out number one it goes back to prevent that single person from walking into an area that could be occupied by a potentially deadly animal. And watch out number two is kind of the opposite of that is opening that primary containment and accidentally letting an animal out. So those are the two things that this two key system is geared to, to prevent. So again, we have our primary containment door. We have these two locks on it. The red key only opens the top lock. It will not open the bottom lock. <coughs> the yellow key opens the bottom lock. It will not open the top lock. And that's the setup that we came up with at Palm Beach. And here's where uh, my CEO, Andrew, challenged me. He said, but we have to not make it more complicated for the keepers. So I worked with our locksmith and um, learned some new terminology, uh, master and submaster. So this is what's considered a submaster key. So there's a master key at Palm Beach U that opens all the locks. And then these two keys are submasters. So what that means is either key will open this lock. So as if I'm working the Panther building the way this is set up, both of us, two keepers, have to be here to take these two locks off and go into the animal space. But if, I, if my job is to show up early and prepare diets or even shift the animals, I can show up, I can open the building, I can shift the animals, I can open the feed chutes, I can go into any of the keeper spaces, but I can't get into that, that room by myself. And that's exactly what Stacy had done that day. She had the key to both locks. She went in there working by herself. So that's why you know, that one thing, this stops that from happening. Uh, through the research that we've done in the safety committee, there's uh, a lot of near miss stories with two keepers, where two keepers went into a space. It wasn't a two key rule, it was a two keeper system. They go into a space and they have a near miss. Um, there's not been a time where two keepers enter a space and they've lost their lives. So that's, that goes back to that common thread. So the two key system, two locks with two different keys for all containment doors. No single person can possess both keys. That is, that is a critical piece of this. Um, the next couple slides talk about the key cabinet, but you have to have a system in place. And at Palm Beach, 
we have, um, we don't call it just culture, but we have a, a coaching mindset with discipline. But if you're a keeper and you have a red key and a yellow key, there's no coaching there. It's your last day of work, as is it the last, per last day for the person that gave you their key, because that is the only way to bypass that engineering control, is if I take my yellow key and I give it to Erin and she has a red key, now she can, she can bypass that engineering control. Um, so the, the separate lock and core for all other doors, that's, that's the submaster key. So all these other doors, they can be used by either key. And then this came out of the investigations and the, you know, everybody that has a key is a suspect. Uh, it was an OSHA recommendation and a uh, Palm Beach PD recommendation that each building have its own key system. So if you have a tiger key, you can't get in the bear building. If you have a bear key, you can't get in the tiger building, um, which strays very far from most what most zoos do. We did have, a, I mean, like Dave said, he was tasked to not make it harder for the keepers. So one of our runs was the two keepers worked bear, jag, and panther. So we just put their key different, but all three of those keys are on the same ring. So yes. at least they're not having to carry these three clunky things around. Um, so they're all keyed on the same. And the keys are all engraved. And so it, if it's a panther key, it says panther, um, panther one for red, panther uh, two for yellow. Um, and it requires a key management system. It can be a key cabinet, which is what we had at Palm Beach. And I think you guys might be in the process of getting some of these. But this key cabinet, the, the great thing about it, it's fingerprint activated. So you can't give somebody your code and they can pull your key for you. Um, we made them convenient. Uh, keepers had to use their fingerprint to scan um, in for the time clock. And right next to it was the key cabinet. So scan your fingerprint that you're here, scan your fingerprint, pull your keys. Um, the key cabinet is set up so it will only give you one key at a time. So you can only have red or you can only have yellow and through programming, if you're trained on tiger but not on bear, you can only pull the tiger key and you can't pull the bear key. Uh, it also, um, it has live alarms and what that means is every time um, one of the deadly animal keys is pulled, it would send a text to the three curators and myself, the facility manager. Um, so we would get notification when those keys were pulled, and we get notification when they put them back. Um, and then- and had an alarm too, so if like at 5.30, keepers should have turned their keys in by five, but like a little bit of leeway, right? So everything goes your way, especially if your cats or animals didn't shift right, or you had a tour or something, you know? Um, so they had an additional alarm, so if your key wasn't put back, they can check on you um, and make sure that you're okay and you're doing, you know, you guys are, are fine um, and you're not just laying somewhere injured um, versus just running late. So that's another system to do that. Yeah, and that, that was a, that's a good thing. Um, again, it's a safety thing, but it was also uh, with key security, you're not allowed to take your keys home. So if it's six o'clock and you get an alert that Aaron's not back yet, and I call her, and she says, well, I'm still shifting the cats. Then she knows she has a radio, plus I'll get notified. Now, if Aaron just forgot she took her keys home, she was required to turn around and come back, uh, even if she lived an hour away. And there was uh, one person that lived quite a ways away that had to turn around and come back. And it's kind of a self-teaching thing. You don't do that too many times because you kill your whole, whole evening. Um, there are other options. Uh, smaller zoos have a hard time with the concept. I mean, that key cabinet's about $12,000 for the first unit. And um, so smaller institutions, uh, they, they react pretty badly to that price tag. But you can have a designated person if you have a security guard or a receptionist that is responsible to hand out keys and can sign them out. Um, and then you can also have a system which is what Cheyenne Mountain has done where you have a staff with, um, all the staff has one key, so everybody has a yellow key, but only that um, supervisor has the red key. So um, you don't have to have the key management then because uh, the supervisor who's not doing daily routines, they can come and take that second lock off and you'll see in a minute how Jeff Halter has done that at uh, Henry Vila. So we also had some, some concern from some of the keepers that they were not really ever to, able to articulate 
a scenario, um, but they were worried and they, were, they said they did not feel safe if they did not have a way to unlock every, key, every lock in that building in case of some sort of emergency. Now, I was able to come up with a couple scenarios in my mind where this is applicable, but they could never tell me. I didn't give it to them, but an example would be if um, someone gets into the exhibit and gets injured, you're able to shift the animal off exhibit, but now I can't get in to do first aid because I don't have both keys. Well, in that case, grab your bolt cutters and cut the lock. So every building had bolt cutters with super long handles because uh, padlocks aren't easy to cut in that building and the keepers were told if there's this emergency and you can get in there safely you need to cut the lock and I'll, I'll, I'll buy a new lock but if it's out of keeper convenience or it's just easier you better not be cutting that lock because you're gonna you're gonna have to uh, explain yourself um, so that that really that helped alleviate that concern and it was a, a simple a simple idea. We talked about, you know, having an emergency box where you break the glass and alarm goes off, but you have the key. But this was really a simple solution to that. So, um, as Jeff kind of mentioned in his talk, you know, you, you bring up one keeper rule versus two keeper rule uh, in the keeper world, and you have yourself a pretty good debate. Uh, and there's a lot of pluses and minuses to both. Uh, we looked at it. Uh, OSA re recommended a full-on two-keeper rule and partially based on that and partially based on the way we were changing our protocols we went to a full two-keeper rule so at Palm Beach the concept is you have you know keeper one gets a red key keeper two gets a yellow key and they're working as a team the whole day so they clean every stall together um, they they do shifting together they clean the exhibits together uh, there are times when um, like in the tiger run, they also had to take care of, say, the wallabies or things like that. So there are times where um, Janice could be over taking care of the wallaby and Damien goes into prep <coughs> diet. So he can do that. There's a communication protocol. But when it comes to anything that crosses that plane from keeper space to animal space, all of those routines, they had to be together. And the keys, the two keys were the engineering control that made it not an option. They had to work it together. Um, so Henry Vilezu did it a little different. So they, what they do, what Jeff calls is a two key handoff with lockout. So it's kind of a weird name, but they don't have the staff to be able to put two keys together or two keepers together. They work their buildings as a single keeper and they don't have the staff. So they use a keeper and a manager. And I think Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has gone to like a keeper and lead keeper uh, and Akron Zoo is doing it the same way. So. Um, the actual only zoo that I know of so far that's doing the two key system with a full two keeper rule is Palm Beach Zoo. Everyone else has done a system uh, similar to what Jeff's going to talk about here. So, um, a little bit more from Jeff. So, Holmes. this is the way that um, exhibit might look in the morning during cat check. Um, and then the exhibit that's up on the right, it's green, it's got the red key on it. So, once you're in three. Um, and this is the way you might uh, find it in the morning. And I want to make sure that I'm clear that the, a little bit of the where we get our uh, system is from. Uh, I, I apologize for that guy running the video camera. He doesn't know what he's doing. The uh, iPad. Doing some operation stuff. And basically, it's the handoff of a space between um, a dangerous element um, and a non dangerous element. So our dangerous our element in this is a tiger um, and so um, one previous thing is I want to talk a little bit about muscle memory there's many days when I wake up in the morning I put my clothes on um, I go to work I show up at work I don't really remember my ride there that's probably for the better um, and then sometimes I'll get up on Sunday I'll put my clothes on and you know I'm going to breakfast and you know what lo and behold I end up at work uh, and then I have to, you know, figure out how I'm going to get from work to wherever I'm really supposed to go. And that is the moment that we're working towards solving here, right? Keepers are opening locks thousands of millions of times in their career. And they have this muscle memory of doing it the same way that I end up um, at work instead of breakfast. It's the same way that a keeper makes a mistake. 
Um, and we can't we can't rely on somebody else fixing that mistake. So in a two keeper system, you say, well, you know, there's somebody else there to catch that mistake. If they're not doing dishes, if they're not uh, busy doing something else, and if we don't take a shortcut, so we can't really rely on that. So, um, so this system kind of helps us with that. All right, so here we go. So we have a manager and a keeper, and this is getting ready to ship the cat um, onto exhibit. And so we call this the handoff of the keeper space to a cat space. And the keeper and the manager are going to check the exhibit, make sure it's secure. It has a yellow lock and blue lock on it. And then they have a conversation. And this conversation, I think, is the key, is one of the keys to it being successful. So one of them says, I think that this is a cat space, and here's why. We have all these locks. And the other person says, I agree, that is definitely a cat space. We have it all secure. And as soon as they have that conversation, the exhibit is a cat space. That still doesn't mean that that cat can be shipped in there, because there are two locks on this um, on this transfer door right here. So instead of lock out, tag out for a transfer door in our situation, we lock them out um, blue and yellow. So after they've made this agreement, each one of them is going to remove their lock and shift the cat. I was impressed when he did that, but I learned how to do it last week. It's not that hard. <laughs> well, at this point, so one, two, three, and the exhibit are all cat spaces. Nothing has happened. Um, it is still a cat space. So if I wanted to, I could shift that animal back, um, back and forth all day long. It's all a cat space. Keeper puts their lock back on. Manager puts their lock back on. Then they're going to go and they're going to get, they have their positive count of the cats, they know where their cat is, they're going to check their stalls visually to make sure that there are no cats in there, and then they're going to have a conversation. I think that it's safe to enter the stalls, and here's why I think that there's a lock that locks the cat out from the exhibit, and there's no cats in the stall, I know where my one cat is, you probably have more than one cat, but I know where all of my cats are. I think that it's safe to enter that stall. The manager agrees with that, then becomes a keeper space. So we define the keeper space versus the um, cat space now. Manager removes the locks and it is now the keeper space. See a manager. The manager leaves. Nothing can happen. Um, that cat can't come back in the building for any reason. Um, there's no safety. Uh, uh, issue there, the cat is all locked up. The keeper removes their locks. There's all their fancy cleaning that they have to do. And then when they're done cleaning, they're going to go ahead and re-secure the space with their yellow locks. Saying that, saying that it's secure. So, at this point, um, maybe it's 10 o'clock in the morning, they're done cleaning. Um, they need to go back in and put in the regimen. They can go back in and put in the regimen. They can lock it back up, go to lunch. They can do whatever they want. That space is a keeper space. They can do it all day long. They can do it all year long. It's going to always be a keeper space until it is turned back over to a cat space. <clears throat> so, the keeper says, all right, well, I'm done cleaning for the day. I've put all my enrichment in there. I can feed through the feed shoes. I've done everything that I want to do. And I'll call the manager. The manager's going to do a lock check with me. We have that ever important conversation that says, I think that this is a cat space. I they agree. <coughs> Secure the, the facility. And now it is cat space again, just like it was when we shipped it out. The manager then, at that point, can remove that lock from the ship door, because that lock's, uh, their lock's purpose is, is over. And they can leave. Now it's all in cat space, so our keeper can remove that lock, they can 
shift that cat. Very cool. Outside, inside, inside, outside. Mm -hmm. They can shift from stall one, stall two, and stall three. Or he's pacing. <laughs> they shift back outside, back in. You get the point? It's all a cat space. And so wherever that cat ends up is um, is fine. Um, it's all a cat space. You see that I put silver locks in between. So when we define a cat space, the, it is truly a conversation of where we're going to lock a cat out. If we had multiple cats in the building, um, we could lock out stall three and stall one and access stall two. Um, it's, we have blue and yellow locks on all those spaces. Um, we want to make sure that we give the flexibility that we can define a cat space um, and still deal with weather events. So, put a cat out on exhibit, and we have an afternoon thunderstorm, our off exhibit holding, uh, which is a lot more secure than the exhibit, um, is a cat space during the day. And so, anybody who is a dangerous animal person can move that cat into off exhibit holding. If the building was already cleaned and we removed the lock for the building, then we would be able to um, pull that cat all the way into the building. So we, do, we can shift in any cat space at any time, um, which gives the flexibility of dealing with, um, you know, kind of a, a natural event that comes up, like a tornado watch, which we get a lot of, or any other kind of weather event that um, might happen. All right. So then our keeper puts the lock back on, and we're done. So that, that's a scenario that would be much more applicable to most of the areas here than a full-on two-keeper system. Um, with the exception of the tiger area, I think that could be done as a two-keeper system, but the rest of the area is really a version of this is, is the seed that I want to kind of plant with you guys to have you guys uh, start that conversation with, with each other. So the next few slides are, are what I call supporting administrative control. So a two-key system without any administrative controls actually becomes not an engineering control because if there's no rule that says I can't give my key to Erin, then she now has both keys and she can go do it. So uh, we rewrote virtually every policy and the image over there is just meant to show that everything in yellow was either changed or added when we rewrote our policies. We firmed up things like communication and clarification of roles and um Key, key management, uh, the concept of all doors are closed before you enter a den, a den. So if you're going into a den, all the shift doors into that den have to be closed, even if the animal's out on exhibit and there's five doors between you, you, you have to have those, those doors closed. That was, that was the policy. That's what makes a two-keeper um, rule work. Uh, the communication is something that I like to really fall back on. So. Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways to communicate and if you, um, if, like the airline industry, when a, a pilot is going through their checklist um, and they, they say what they want to, you know, flaps are down and the co-pilot flaps are down, check. So you, to say that back and forth because if you just say um, opening gate six and I'm not really paying attention and I thought you said gate seven and I just say okay and I'm on the other side of gate seven and didn't hear it so the the repeating back exactly what's happening so opening gate six opening gate six check or you know, you guys need to come up with what works for you but we really we went to that at Palm Beach uh, it really makes things go smoother even if you're standing right next to each other and you're opening a shift gate to say it out loud to create that that habit of always saying it out loud uh, is a really important piece. An example of that I shared actually with some of the keepers this morning because um, we actually added, which he'll show, uh, cameras to the areas too. So we do like some random spot checks, not like you're literally being watched all the time, but we can do spot checks to make sure you're following the protocol as well. Um, but one of the things we actually asked one of the curators to just video like how Palm Beach does their, their stuff for routine just for some of these presentations we're giving and um, on the video I actually caught the, the one keeper you know opening G2 and the other keeper repeated closing G2. So it was just really like eerie you know it's just one of those things that like okay just proves the point that when we 
think we hear one thing, or we, we say the one thing we think the other keeper heard it just how I said it, and they say, okay, oh, you're good, or oh, 10 4. Well, what did they actually hear? Because that keeper heard closing while the other keeper meant opening. So it was just kind of interesting to see. It was actually on video um, for one of the presentations we were giving, but it just kind of proves the point um, that we may not always hear um, what the other person said correctly. So the other thing we created, and we had, we had really had a system in place where monthly the curator would shadow the keepers and um, check the protocol. We didn't have a good tracking system. It took us uh, several weeks to create the documentation OSHA needed. Uh, so we, we created a tracking system, but the other thing that we did using the cameras, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, the curators are able to spot check everybody once a month kind of literally from their desk once it was all networked. Um, you can go back and look at Erin's routine from last Tuesday when she was working Tigers and, and you can follow the protocols, things like that. Um, and that really, um, you know, the, and sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, so that was, that was a big piece of it, having the tracking, um, kind of really beefing up the one-on-one -on -one training, uh, not training by reading a protocol, but training by practicing, and then uh, monthly reports to the CEO. Uh, some other supporting administrative controls um, we've talked about is the video monitoring of uh, the keeper spaces. So something that um, I had never heard before that OSHA told us during the investigation was that as the managers of the zoo, it's our responsibility to know that our staff is following every protocol every minute of every day. So it's not enough to just have a safe protocol, you have to know your staff is following it. And they tell you that without any method as to how. And um, we, we really looked at them and said, well, how are we supposed to do that? And they, their answer was, that's not our problem. That's your responsibility. Um, so it was actually, I believe, our workers' comp investigator that mentioned that if you, you have video cameras on the keeper spaces, so every shift door, every primary containment door has a camera on it, so now we can go back, we can spot check. If there's an incident, we could certainly uh, aid in the investigation. And, and so we were really worried that you know, the, the big brother feeling would come into play, and it didn't take the keepers long to get used to the fact that they were on camera. And then what it really aided in is kind of what Just Culture is all about. It aided in self-reporting. If you know you made a mistake on camera and you go tell your supervisor and you talk about it and you learn from it and you didn't get in trouble, that really kind of reinforces the coaching uh, mentality. So it really has turned out to be a positive where people would um, learn from little mistakes and then little things that they didn't know they were, they were doing. And I, I forgot to give this example yesterday, but we had um, we had a little zoo kickball team um, for a few months and one of the people, one of the tiger keepers was on the team and she hurt her knee playing kickball. So when she needed to go down and unlock the bottom lock, she couldn't bend down so she would put her hand up and bend down and when her supervisor saw it um, on the camera, she was putting her hand where the tiger could have come through and got her and she had no idea she was doing it. And so when when um, they reviewed it with her, she said, oh my gosh, and she was able to you know, change her routine and put her hand in a place where she wasn't putting herself in danger. So it was a little thing she didn't even realize she was doing. She didn't get written up, she didn't get in trouble, but she learned from it and was able to be safer moving forward. So um, it's, it's not a, a big thing to be, to be scared of. Uh, it really was a good thing. So we've gone through quite a few areas and we've talked to a lot of the keepers here uh, at Denver already. A lot of your areas have this exact scenario where the kind of cream colored walls and kind of the cream colored doors and uh, this was an OSHA uh, recommendation. You know, in industry they would, they would never do, do this where you can't, you can't easily see the difference between a door and, um, and the, the walls around it. So they suggested uh, dark paint. A lot of questions have come up, why can't you paint the doors? Well, one of the beauties of these um, plastic doors is that nothing sticks to them, including paint. So our option was we uh, epoxy painted basically from about shoulder height down 
um, all of our areas dark green. We didn't want to go all the way up because we didn't want the rooms to feel dark. Uh, but you know, keepers were hesitant at first because they didn't think they would like it, but they, they really liked the feel of it. It's contrast not only with the doors, but with most of the animals. Um, it just made things easier to see kind of out of your corner of your eye. And that's one of those, um, back to the Just Culture presentation, it's just a layer of cheese. It doesn't fix or completely solve any problem, but if the other layers have gotten missed and you're walking in out of the corner of your eye, you see that door is open, you can now take that step back. So um, that's a really important thing. The keepers really like that after the fact. Um, the signage of uh, gate control signage, so indicators when doors are open and closed. Uh, again, it, it's, a, it's a layer. It's not that this says door S2 is closed. That doesn't mean I don't have to go look at door S2. You still want to make sure there wasn't a mechanical failure and the door is actually open. But now you know that the door is supposed to be closed. Um, there's every zoo we've been to that has done this has done it in a different way uh, at Palm Beach we did green is closed which is counterintuitive for a lot of people um, but the reason green is closed because if the door is closed I'm green it's it's good to go in if the door is open that means stop don't go in uh, so it's about the human not about the animal um, those are placed basically where the locking right. mechanism is yes because um, I know uh, Jacksonville, I think, they do it the opposite. So green means the animal can go, and red means the animal is stopped. So they, you know, and this is another thing. If you want to do this, you need to talk amongst yourselves what makes the most sense. Um, that is what made the most sense for us at Palm Beach. And then whatever method you come up with, creating a uniform system that then you implement in kind of all the buildings so all the buildings are the same is, is an important piece to that. Same with gate identification. You guys actually have this down pretty well already, uh, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Palm Beach, we had you know versions of just about anything you could imagine, from you know little pieces of paper taped on there to sharpie <coughs> written on, um, and then other buildings where you just had to follow the cable and know what door was operating what gate. Uh, bedroom access signs. This was an OSHA recommendation, and this comes really from industry. If you have a hazard and you have the means to isolate the hazard, you need a sign so that someone coming to do maintenance, somebody who's not familiar with the area, they can, they can figure it out. So our protocol that before you go into a bedroom, all the doors have to be closed, clearly stated. Location is clearly stated how you isolate the hazard. These doors have to be closed before you're allowed to go in. So we have that on every, every bedroom door for every potentially deadly animal at the zoo. Uh, it is helpful for your maintenance guys or your, your facility directors who knew how, now have a, sight, a heightened sense of awareness, but they're not in there every day. I can look at a sign, I can say, okay, G3, S1, I can, I can find the operators, I can confirm my, for myself that it's been closed. Uh, animal access sign, this was uh, an unbelievable uh, controversy through the whole process. So um, this is physically the sign that was on the den where Stacy um, had her incident. And you can see by, this is an example if, you know, these are Velcro tabs. If it was hanging on the door, if you slam the door too hard and the Velcro lets go, it says the animal's not on exhibit or there's no animal access. We, we designed a sign that was heavy duty. It uses magnets instead of Velcro that wears out. Uh, it's all aluminum and stainless steel. And if you slam the door too hard and it does open, it defaults to animal has access. And it was, it was frustrating um, as a group of zoo people to have this be a major focus of the investigation because you know, keepers know you, you need to have a positive count of your cats. And even if this says the animal has access or says that it doesn't have access, so if it says no animal access, does that mean as a keeper you're just gonna not check anything and walk in with blinders on? Well, no, this is, again, this is a layer. Um, it's an important layer, but um, it was a primary focus for quite a while in the investigation. I mean, this is literally from a news conference where Andrew had to explain this process live on TV. It was. Um, it is a good visual, you know, cue like they were talking yeah. about earlier in the Just Culture uh, presentation too. It kind of gives you another cue for your mind to be like, oh, right. what am I doing? 
right? It's not that you count on it, but it's a cue to know an animal is supposed to be or isn't supposed to be in here. And, and if the opposite is true, then you need to take a step back and figure out what went wrong. Um, light switches on the outside of buildings. So, you know, it, it was, it's like a no brainer to me now, but when we went over to that tiger building at uh, close to midnight with the OSHA inspector and he was terrified to open the door because to turn the lights on, we had to open the door and, and he said, how do I know there's not a tiger in there? And of course we knew because we had securely um, secured all the cats, uh, but you know, it made sense to put the light switch on the outside of the door so that when you're going into a building and it's dark, all the keeper spaces are, are lit up. And, um, and that's just something to, to look at in your areas here. If that's not the case, it's a, it's a pretty simple thing typically. Um, mirrors to eliminate blind spots. And I, I don't have a picture of it, uh, but it has come up in a few of our walkthroughs here. You can also put these bubble mirrors in spaces that are shared with the animals, you just have to put a cage around them. It makes them a little, a little less clear, but we did have, you know, actually through this door right here, there's a chute with some blind spots. We put a mirror in uh, with mesh in front of it to protect it so that we could see the blind spot. And then any exterior doors that open out, um, if it's a mechanism that the animal could uh, theoretically swipe open, uh, it needs to have a shield on it. That was. I think more of a Florida thing. And then um, when it comes down to the PPE, uh, we had a, uh, a training protocol and it was basically what I call paper training. So you had to read the protocol and sign it, okay, I'm trained. And then the policy was, um, you know, when you're going into a, a potentially deadly animal area, you have to have that um, on you. Uh, so we went to, uh, annual training. Everybody has to be retrained every year. Uh, it's an in-person training and uh, you can buy test canisters that don't have the actual pepper spray in them and you fire a test canister. It's just like if you've ever done a fire extinguisher training, you can talk about it all you want, but there's nothing like grabbing a fire extinguisher and um, squeezing that handle and, and seeing what it really does. So we do that uh, with the pepper spray. And then it also changed to a policy that it's part of your uniform. So if you're a trained deadly animal keeper and you're working that area for the day, when you show up in the morning, you have your own personal assigned um, OC-10 spray and you put it on your belt and you take it off when you leave. And that way you always have it on you. Uh, in Stacy's case, her pepper spray was sitting on the counter uh, in the keeper area. It was not on her when she went in the space. There's no way to know if that would have made a difference or not, um, but the simple fact is if it could have made a difference, she didn't take it with her. So uh, that was, that's the whole reason for that change. And, and I, it's, to me, it's another one of those. It's kind of a, a no-brainer. There was a little bit of talk about the perception when you're walking out in guest path and if somebody grabs it and all of this. And, is all mitigated by the fact that if you leave it up to the human brain to every time I go in there, I have to remember to grab it and you forget and it costs you your life, the other things are manageable. That one's not. Um, a, a budget piece because it, it most often <coughs> comes up to do all of the things that we did in all of those areas. You know, the biggest two are you know, a piece of the key watcher cabinet and um, rekeying the locks. The video camera system we did for $5,000 a building. It wasn't uh, the end of the world. You know, after you've had an incident and you're making changes, kind of money is no object. So it was easy at Palm Beach Zoo. And when you haven't had an incident, um, a lot of these costs are harder to argue. Um, Jeff Halter implemented the two key system fully at Henry Viola Zoo for $4,000 total for the whole zoo. It's a really small zoo, um, but you know, there's, there's affordable ways to do some of these things. Uh, we contracted out all the color contrast painting. We, did, you know, we could have done that in-house and taken more time, things like that. Um, so creative ways to save money if you need to. And then, uh, um, after, so after we lost Stacy, about a month later was our annual 
5K race that raises money for tiger conservation. So the zoo chose to um, rename that to the uh, Stacy Conweiser Memorial Save the Tiger 5K, and the proceeds for that go into a scholarship fund in her name. And the, the first year that we did that, um, we went from having between three and 400 runners um, at the race to uh, over 600 physically on site. And then we had 100 people from 12 states across the country that knew Stacy either through a felid tag or from working with her at other institutions. Um, and they all ran a virtual race. Uh, at the same time and posted pictures on social media and it was a really great tribute to her but of course it's something we would obviously so if you were one of them, thank you. Yes. I, I know we had a few people like feeling When it went through and I was organizing it I, I literally knew every name in every state and every zoo they were from but it's um, I, I don't remember all those details anymore but it was it was pretty impressive to get the messages and the impact that she had had and it's you know, it really reinforces why we need to do this because we're, we're losing great people when these things happen. Um, so, so what does this mean for AZA Zoo? So the safety committee is taking notice. Uh, I was recently made chair of the safety committee, so I, I know that the commitment is, is clearly there on the committee as well as many other issues. Um, it's going to be implemented this year into accreditation as a best practice and we're working on making some of the things that in this presentation is actual accreditation standards but that's a process that really takes time in the meantime we're talking about it we're sharing it we're getting best practices out there so that zoos that haven't heard the talk that are still trying to figure things out they can kind of stumble across it um, there are there, there's a couple zoos that I think are working on it, but I don't have confirmation, but there's at least 10 zoos that are working on it, trying to implement this, and um, it's, it's really great to be able to add Denver Zoo to that list, that you guys are having the talk, you're meeting, you're thinking about ways to make your zoo safer. So um, I applaud you guys and your leadership for, for having you, you guys be part of that. So the, the last thing, um, if you guys are talking about this and you're, you're, you're stuck and you're hitting roadblocks or you're, you just can't figure it out, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're your resource uh, for the rest of our careers uh, to help troubleshoot if you need it. Um, if you want to see Jeff Halter's full presentation, uh, there's also a presentation um, from Tracy who was at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and uh, kind of a recap presentation of the changes part of mine is all, if you just search for my name and AZA on YouTube, uh, it'll come up. It's, uh, it's a great presentation. Um, I know Becca saw it uh, last spring. And then anybody that's at AZA Midyear next year, we will have a great safety summit. I promise you that. We'll cover some of these topics as well as others. So there's my plug for that. And with that, anyone have any questions? So I just want to add in a, a piece, I guess, for me, is, is that I think there's two reasons why I'm passionate about this stuff. And, and, and one is um, that uh, I made the same mistake that I actually did a few months before she died. And there's no good reason why I'm standing here other than I forgot my break. That is the only reason I'm alive. Um, and I made the same mistake, actually did the same mistake Stacy did, the same mistake Brexit did. It really cemented in me that it could happen to anybody. Um, I had 15 years of experience um, when it happened. Uh, and so that has made me think about safety a, a lot differently. And I think the other piece that has changed for me, and Jeff mentioned it in his talk, and Jeff and I came up uh, together as keepers. And I used to think of safety as very much my responsibility as an individual and keeping myself safe. Um, and now it's my responsibility to keep 120 of you safe. Um, and I take that very seriously. And, and when one of you makes a mistake and when something happens, I, I feel responsible for that. I always, I always ask myself, how, how could I have prevented this or how can I make this better? And I take, that, I take that really seriously. And so that's why I know some of this is hard to talk about and it's hard to hear and it's hard to think about, but um, this is why it's so important. I, I think you know, we have phenomenal people here who do a phenomenal job, but, but there's still gaps and there's, there's things we can do better. Um, and we very much want to do this in a way of 
we want to we want to try some things out. We want to test some things. We want to let you guys break some things, and and find out what works for you. I, I didn't want to come in and say you know we're mandating um, you know a particular system because I think we have to figure out what works you know for us. But I also think uh, we can figure out something that's a little more consistent across the zoo. So uh, thank you guys for taking the time to to listen to these guys. And thank you guys for yes. coming in and telling the story twice. <laughs> so. Well, well, I wanted to say thank you to you because that year that I <coughs> passed away, we had a lot of code reds. I think I've looked at a lot of code reds more than anyone should. And I think some of the changes you've made, just like just culture, all those things really contribute to being a safer place. And I think that you've helped change the culture. So thank you for making this. And we've been, I mean, we've both worked at a previous institution. I'm with you together now. Um, that had a near death, and um, there weren't really many changes that were made after, um, as far as you know, making sure the keepers were okay, and you know, not letting them work alone and things like that. Um, the overall standards as elephant area, um, so overall elephant standards have changed over time, um, but just as a whole, you know, the fact that the zoo is taking things very seriously to look at what's going to work best for everybody and just allowing the input um, is pretty huge because most zoos, many zoos probably don't do that. Um, we've been to, as he listed, a few zoos on this presentation um, that we've been to and just talked to everybody and, you know, like he said, there's, the way Palm Beach Zoo is doing it is, the, is one of the ones that we know is the only way they're doing it. Henry Valley Zoo is doing it a slightly different way. Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is doing it a little bit different way. We've been to Zoo Atlanta talk to them, um, they might come up with their own way to do it. It's kind of still the same core rule, um, just having the two lock system, but in your own way. So you guys may have a completely different way, which maybe we'll be able to include, you know, in future presentations. Um, so I think if we can figure out how to do it at Predator Ridge and Tap, we yeah. can sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's in our side. Zoo Atlanta, if you guys have ever been there, their ring and, and gorilla buildings are very complicated. So we kind of were like, well, if they can do it there. And if you guys can do it at Predator Ridge, like, the, the nobody, no, nobody has an excuse. Right. <laughs> at least from what we've seen based on how usually how simple some of the other zoo areas are. Because um, a lot of them are more straightforward. Like, the Tiger Building is pretty similar here than it was at, at Palm Beach or is at Palm Beach, too. So that one may be a little bit easy to do. But some of your more complex areas, um, it's going to take a lot of hard work. And it's going to take voicing your opinion one way or the other. Whether you say, yes, this is working, or no, this is not working, and here's why. Um, or this is working and here's why. So just making sure, like he said before, I know animal people usually aren't boisterous with certain things, except maybe to each other. Um, but you're usually afraid to, to um, bring up issues sometimes. Um, some of you may not be. I'm usually one that's not. I can tell whoever, whatever, at any time. Um, but just make sure you, you know you guys have a voice right now and they're willing to listen, which is really big. Yes? I was curious with the, the two keeper system that um, they now have, what kind of protocols have you had to put in place or change with um, human nature and people are together and they chat and, you know, may get distracted by the safety of what's going on in the moment? How, do, how have you dealt with that part of it? Um, they, we didn't really have that too bad at Palm Beach, but we had that shock. And so, I mean, you guys have talked here a little bit about drift. I'd be interested to go back there now and see if there's a little bit more chit chat. Uh, but if you do, if you go to this link and you see uh, Tracy's talk from Cheyenne Mountain, they have uh, what she calls the sterile cockpit. So there's a point in time when you, you cross that door into that deadly animal area. Now, you're not talking about what you had for dinner last night. You're talking about your job. Um, if you go to Akron Zoo, one of their big worries is um, cell phones being a distraction. So they have a red mailbox. So when you're going into, when you're crossing through secondary containment, there's a red mailbox. And whether you're the CEO or a keeper, your phone goes in that red mailbox. Uh, if you need to go in and take pictures, it's a radio call and it's special permission. Him taking my phone in. I need to take pictures of the tiger. As soon as I'm done, I'm gonna put my phone back. Um, I got a free pass when I was there because I was taking notes on my phone and taking pictures, but that was, that was really a big deal for them 
to have somebody that was allowed to take a phone. So um, in this straight up, uh, in the kind of the, I'll call it the old way of the two keeper rule where you're just putting two people on a task and there's not a lot of controls, um, that, that's one of the things in the debate is two keepers are actually a distraction. And I've heard some near miss stories where it's 100% true, where you're talking about dinner last night while well, you're unlocking locks and you shift a gate and you, you go on out and you didn't close the gate. Um, so to have a, have a protocol, I think it does need to be addressed that when you're, when you're at that point in your routine where, okay, now it's serious, you know, we're not just prepping diets, we're, going, we're shifting animals, we're going into animal space. You, you got to have it in the protocol, and that's that's one of those supporting administrative controls. It is important. Go hand in hand. Um, yeah. One thing that we did, uh, like he said, we're side by side kind of all the time. Um, so basically, as soon as as soon as we get to let's say the tiger building, um, we were pretty fortunate. It's very similar, like I said, as the tiger building here, where it's kind of very linear. Um, so I can see every bedroom from the outside of the building. Uh, so I, we would make sure both keepers have to check through the window and verify that each door is closed and we have a bubble mirror that I don't see a tiger over here in this blind spot. I checked, now you know, Dave can check, make sure he's checking for all the same things. Okay to enter, okay to enter. So we enter and as soon as we enter, we're double checking locks and I'm checking as the second person right behind me is literally mimicking and looking at everything that I'm looking at. Um, so we were very much, very, very close. Um, so not really, I mean, we're doing the task at hand, not really and some of the, the two-way communication will, will break some of that. So mm -hmm. say you are talking about the movie you saw last night, and now you're going to open shift door two, you have to stop your conversation. Mm -hmm. Opening shift door two, she has to repeat it back, opening shift door two. Uh, so you know, the, the communication is a really important piece, and, and it's something that you know, on top of you know, brainstorming how do you make the two key system work in a place like Predator Ridge, you need to talk about how does the communication need to work in a complicated place like Predator Ridge because they really are hand in hand. Even saying things out loud like, you know, well, Barafi's in one and two, Kadar's in three and four, you know, even though I see that as I'm going through, but you, you know, verbally saying it and then the other keeper may be repeating it or just getting those words out loud rather than just you're assuming you saw that they're in one and two and you're assuming your other person did too. Um, and I know a couple of the keepers thought it was kind of weird at first. You know, you're yeah. standing next to each other to say things out loud, but it, it really, it does, it, it helps put a stop to the kind of the chit chat and it really makes you take notice and really think about and you know, change it, get it away from the lizard brain where you're just going through the motions and you're having to visually see and say out loud what you're seeing. We would honestly go through first make entry we would double check everything um, make sure it was locked secured um, and then we'd start you know we talk about what we we're getting ready to do um, we need to bring so-and-so off the exhibit or we need to move her to one or whatever and then we would go back to that bedroom and you know we need to close this room this room this room we have that conversation individually with each each kind of area so really not a lot of room for talk other than what you're actually doing um, so I think Having gone through it, obviously, like Dave said, maybe there's some leniency now, but I feel like the way that at least it's set up, um, they very much have to kind of continually talk about, it's not just one person talking and the other one maybe listening or whatever. So we have another group that has to meet the at 1.30. Okay. okay. Sorry, we have to wrap up. Um, those of you that are in dangerous areas, if you haven't seen these guys already,